Welcome to Let's Talk College. Thank you guys for, for tuning in the very first interview. Uh, Yazan, Yazan, would you introduce yourself a little bit and let's talk a little bit about uh, just, just who you are and maybe how we know each other and, and that sort of stuff. Sure. So um, first of all, I'm Yazan Abuhijle and I uh, just graduated from CU Boulder uh, 2020 in the spring. So the quarantine class of 2020, which is really weird. That's a whole whole uh, other story in and of itself. Um, and then I was introduced to Shane. You were my I, I, sophomore year um, English teacher. And, you know, he honestly was one of the first teachers that, that um, instead of like scolding me for my behavior, which at times was a little much, you know, taught me to <laughs> hone in that chaotic energy and, and put it towards, uh, <laughs> put it towards no being productive in a lot events. of ways. So, um, you know, I, I always appreciated that and um, the relationship uh, continued and I ended up interning for you, I guess that was summer 2017, something like that. So uh, yeah, um, we've kind of been in touch on and off ever since. So uh, it's been really cool. And I honestly can't say I'm in touch with um, other teachers in this capacity. So Thank you for um, having me, and this is a cool opportunity. I'm excited. It's the very first interview, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, you know, the idea of it, I hope, you know, if, you, if people have read it, it's the idea is to, to talk with students, uh, parents that I've worked with in the past, and get an idea of, you know, what you're doing now, how you got there, what was the college path like for you, what are the things you thought about in high school, just a lot of things, but mostly just a conversation. Let's just talk about what you're doing and, and where you are. So you're starting a new job next week, right? Yeah, I am. Um, it's actually, job? it's, it's, uh, it's my second job that I'll be starting since I graduated my, my first one. Uh, my first one was a recruiting role, a corporate recruiting role. And I was just happy to have a job outside of college. But for those that do recruiting or are familiar with the industry, it's a pretty, it's a pretty like grind intensive industry. It's a lot of cold calling, um, doesn't have a lot of rich creative energy involved there and it really just wasn't for me so and and ended up not working out um so this new job is with fidelity my background is in accounting and finance um and this will be it's kind of a foundational role to start a career in financial planning um i really have this goal to work with musicians because i love music that's right i really want to integrate uh, my passion for music with whatever i'm doing career-wise i think that's the only way to um you know, have a sustainable career, in my opinion, is I really got to be passionate about it. And I'm not intrinsically passionate about finance. So I want to find a way to couple um, some technical skills with some more uh, creative, passionate curiosities of mine. So what is it about music? I mean, the, the, the musician thing, uh, what's, your, what, what's your vision for doing, doing that? So I, I really, I want to be a, a financial planner for musicians. Um, I think that musicians especially from a financial perspective, are a group that are typically taken advantage of um, and, you know, get screwed over a lot of times. Reason being, if you're an artist that, you're, you know, your ultimate goal is to make a living off of your music and in any capacity. And a lot of the times record labels will come along, you know, if you've done well enough and will say, hey, you know, we, we love your music. We're prepared to pay you $300,000 right now. But in the end, they, the, the label ends up owning your next, you know, two albums and like three singles and you don't make any money off of that anymore. So what ends up happening is you're probably a little bit underpaid for your music if it really takes off. And then also you've suddenly been given a lump sum of money um, and there's a lot of different ways you can spend it and you might not get a lump sum of money like that ever again. So I think it's really important to have somebody who's financially wise to step in and say how can we put that money to work for you that way it doesn't just get um you know spoiled and i, and I think just it's a cool group to work with as well. so you and i both know that my i mean as exhibited by getting this first episode started my technical prowess is, is somewhat limiting so don't don't artists have like a lot of ways nowadays between the different platforms where you can push your music out uh, don't artists have a lot of ways to to circumvent the label itself? Is that not something? It, there is. And I, I had some experience um, working at a record label, uh, I guess maybe three summers ago. It was a record label in Nashville called Curb Records. And that was actually one of the, 
one of the issues that I brought up to them um, was something I like to call the Chance the Rapper effect because Chance the Rapper is like notorious for, you know, completely circumventing the record label process and, you know, becoming a platinum selling artist. It is still very possible to 100% own your music and, you know, put your name out there and, and become famous um, you know, or, or be successful in whatever capacity, you know, you feel that is. But I still think record labels serve a purpose. Um, you know, they offer infrastructure and guidance to artists. There's a lot of things like booking shows that can be a real headache. Um, it's also nice to have a team that's doing your marketing. And so, you know, they, they, they do still have um, a, a role in the music industry and I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, and I still think they are a valuable resource to artists, maybe just not in the, in the same capacity that they used to be. I, I definitely have, that's awesome. Have you, have you been working? I mean, so is this something Fidelity, like is it, it's a niche for Fidelity that they're going to have, or is this Yazan's vision of what he, he thinks like the, the job's going to do? How, how does that work? Yeah, so this is very much like something just for me personally. I think for whatever job you do, you need to find a reason to do it. Um, you know, you need to you need to find the value in it beyond just the paycheck that you'll be receiving. Uh, and and for me, it's this role will give me the opportunity to help a group that I think needs helping or you know needs this service. And so it really is just more a, a motivator for me. Um, to get through this kind of preliminary stage, which is like, you know, it's a lot of studying for cert certifications and whatnot, but it's motivation. And then um, hopefully when I start, you know, financial planning and it's, you know, in it's complete sense in the future, um, you know, that's the clients that I'd want to, to go for. So I think specialization is key. So certifications, you, you still have some more certifications you're going to have to do for fidelity, even though you've now got your college degree and all you, there's some more things you got to do. What are, what are those? So I'll be the, for this role. Um, it's called the customer relationship advocate. Basically I'll be doing a customer service job, but fidelity will be paying me to get my series um, series 63 and series seven certification. Okay. Um, which basically is just like, it, it says that you're certified uh, and understand like securities and different um, investment vehicles. Um, and so that's kind of like mandatory to be in financial planning. And so my college education could not give that to me. Um, so this is kind of the next step. Well, on the, the series, uh, what is the series 63? I know a little bit weird as it is. My mom years ago had to do a series seven and I helped her. I gave her some hints, some hints on, on, uh, uh, you know, how to do, how to prep for that. That was back in like, man, that's probably in 2000, maybe in the nineties. Um, when she had to do her, her series seven. So I know a little bit about that. It's a tough test, isn't it? Don't it a lot is. of people I mean, fail at the first time? It, I, I, from my understanding, um, in terms of the content of the test, I actually have very limited understanding of what that's going to look like. And that's part of this new job is like, you know, they give you resources and um, literally like teachers to help teach you about the subject matter on the test. Um, it's all securities related and stocks and bonds and ETFs, as far as my understanding is, but the pass rate is typically only like 70% nationally. Um, so that's like pretty scary yeah. because, you know, that, that basically means you got a 30% chance of <laughs> failing, which is not comfortable odds in my opinion. But it's one of these, it's one of these, it's funny because people are all, all these people are upset about the SAT and the ACT, right? With what's going mm -hmm. on with COVID and quarantines. And it's just not fair that we still have these tests. And, and I, I always think, you know, they're not going away. You're <laughs> after you from college. It's there's still going to be certifications you have to do licensing tests you have to do. So here you are, even after finishing up, you're going to have to do another test. And, and I know, I do know what, what is series 63 related to series seven. I kind of have an idea. The, the series 63 is, I know it's like state specific for the state. It's licensed, uh, your licensing for the state of Colorado. Okay. And as like literally the only thing I know up to this point is that it has to do with securities. It's okay. all about, um, stocks, bonds, ETFs, basically having an intricate understanding of those because that's going to be one of the products or investment vehicles that you'll be um, telling your clients about. And you want to be 
you want to know the ins and outs of all of that. It's, it's um, probably diving into the regulations, right? The laws right, and what you can right. and can't say. Okay. And then, okay. Uh, I mean, there's more stuff. certification beyond that too. I mean, there's going to be certifications for insurance, like life insurance, different things. It's so, um, okay. it's going to be a very intense process, but you know, anything, anything that's worth doing isn't necessarily easy. How long is it? How long does it have to, how long do you have to complete that? I think it's like, I'll have two to four months of like studying. And basically the majority of my work day is going to be studying. And you know, it, like that's what I'm essentially getting paid to do. Okay, so um, so you get a salary there, while you study. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hourly technically, but I mean, like I, I'm still getting paid a good amount. And then and you consider that you're getting paid to further your education, essentially like just the reverse of what college is. <laughs> like, I think it's, it's it makes me much more motivated oh. to, to stick with it. And the, the series seven to series three that will go with you. Like that, Fidelity doesn't own that. You, you own that licensing, right? Right. Yeah, that's, right. that's unique to me. So I, I think that's special. And regardless, the information is valuable for me on a personal level. So and uh, so one of the purposes of the blog or of the podcast rather is to talk with people and, and, and kind of clarify that there's not one path. Like there's lots of paths to success. I think sometimes people have uh, this view, they get this idea, high school students, parents, that in order to be successful, you need to go to one of these schools and they get a list and they hear things like Goldman Sachs is only going to recruit from these schools. And, and it's like, that's the not the only way you're going to be successful. It's not the only way you're going to get to your your goals. A couple of questions about just when you were getting ready for college. Uh, was UC Boulder your choice? Like what schools were you looking at when you were in high school? Yeah. So, um, you know, I was looking at Texas schools like UT, A&M. I was on, those were on my list, just something local and close to home. Um, my reach schools were like NYU and Cornell, which looking back on it, it was like, why, why did I even bother? I did not have the credentials for that. Um, There's some then, lessons that, that life just has to teach us. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately for those lessons, like they cost like $70 for each application fee. So, um, you know, it is what it is. It was worth the shot. Um, and then I applied to some schools that I ended up not even checking out in person, but um, schools like San Diego State, Temple. The reason I applied to those schools was because I was, you know, positive I would get in and I felt confident that I would receive some amount of scholarship you know, money. I remember school. hearing from you right before, you, right, right, right towards the end of your senior year and you, you got an offer, or you got accepted to Temple. Mm -hmm. And didn't you get a, like a pretty good scholarship offer? It was, from it was like, well? a, like a, like a 50% um, scholarship. So it was, a, it was a, a good chunk of change. Um, you know, and, and that definitely like forced me to think about that a little bit more. But, um, you know, I ended up picking CU Boulder because the only reason I can say I did was gut feeling. It had nothing to do with the merit of the business school. It had nothing to do with like, you know, oh, they have the nicest dorm facilities. It, the only reason I picked it was because when we were driving to campus, there's this part where you go over this hill on the highway you're driving and you're like you're like where the hell are the mountains where's everything and you drive over this hill and all of a sudden you're looking straight down into boulder valley the mountains are all around yeah and it is just, gorgeous like it was it, it was just it felt special to me yeah um and i was like you know we pulled up right after looking at nyu and i was like this is where i'm going I, that like it was a two second <laughs> a two second thing um and i convinced myself that that's where i needed to be okay it, um, that's cool. And it's so kind of, you, you saw it and you're like, this is, you had a feel for like, this is the right place for me. And yeah. you went through, I mean, you're, how many people, you know, we were talking about one of your friends one from, from high school who's in, in the same English class with you earlier, yeah, yeah. who's had a different path uh, and hasn't finished college. Um, how many, do you, your friends from high school, like there's a couple of students that I'm going to talk to uh, that I'm really excited to, to kind of share their story uh, about it, but that they went off to some place for college and then they came back and, or they, they ended up like a semester in two semesters in and they, that just wasn't the right place for them. Do you ever talk to any people that that happened for them? Yeah. And I mean, um, you know, that, that one student we were talking about earlier that ended up uh, quitting college, um, you know, he was my best friend in high school. He still is one of my best friends. And we both went to see you. We both went to see you Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, but we both ended up being on very divergent paths. But, you know, today 
you know, I would say that we're, you know, he, he's actually doing better than me from a financial perspective, definitely a financial perspective. Um, but basically like for, for him, uh, you know, he ended up, he ended up leaving because ROTC scholarship ended up not working out and, you know, oh, I don't know, I didn't know he did an ROTC and, scholarship, but you know, it, it just college in general wasn't his thing. That's the reality. Um, for me personally, like it never felt like I had another option, but the more people I talk to now, there's this growing confidence that college is not the end all and be all of your success. There are a multitude of other factors that come into play. And so you look at a school like CU, I mean, I'm pretty sure something like 20% of students end up dropping out. Um, there's also a lot of reasons that happens at CU specifically. But um, <laughs> I remember teasing you about like one of the factors being some new legislation that might have been yeah, passed in yeah, Colorado. Some, some really flexible state laws that they have there uh, definitely drive some people there. Um, but really the, the reality is, when you're in high school, you have a very limited scope of what success looks like. And especially at a place like South Lake, where we were, um, it was like, you're going to go to college, you're going to get a specialized degree, you're going to get a job right outside of college. And, you know, then you're going to work to 20 to 40 years of your life. And, and you know, that there you go and retire, boom, <laughs> blueprints laid out, you're done. Simply is not the case. I have friends that didn't finish college that are successful. I have friends that graduated and decided I'm going to move for, to Hawaii and be a, a seaweed farmer, literally a seaweed <laughs> farmer. Like that's, that's a thing, you know, like they got a, a $200,000 degree to go grow seaweed. But when they were doing, when they were doing their, their, their do what you are back in high school in Navi, you think seaweed farmer popped up on the list. <laughs> this would be a great match for you. No, it's, the it, that's the thing. It's never even in the realm of possibilities when you're in high school, you like, you know, you think people are like, I'm going to do STEM or I'm going to be, you know, like in, in business. That's probably the two most common medical school, right? I'm going yeah, yeah. to, yeah. has this, this, the medical Academy and everyone's going to be a doctor. Or everyone's going to be a lawyer. And I'm, I would really be interested to see how many of the students who go to CMA do the medical academy in high school don't even go in. I, I know several students that had nothing to do with them. Now, I know several students that did, that yeah. are in medical school now or are now doctors. Um, so it's a great program. But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how you, you get that idea of this is how the future is going to go. And then, like I said, some, some lessons life has to teach you that yeah. mom and dad teachers can't really do. So, um, that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely the case. And I mean, I think um, the other thing is I think in high school, you know, people are incredibly naive about just how many barriers to entry there are to certain things. And I'll tell like a super quick story, but I always thought I wanted to do investment banking. That's where I really saw myself. And we went to this uh, seminar, like everybody in the business school. And I went to this, you know, I banking group um, within that seminar and, there's a guy there that works on Wall Street and he goes, raise your hand if you want to be in investment banking. And so everybody raises their hand because they're like, yeah. And then, um, you know, then he goes, you know, who wants to be in commercial banking? Like who wants to be selling mortgages to people and whatnot? And maybe one person raised their hand. And he was like, 99% of you are not going to be in investment banking. So there are kids in New York who are going to the right preschool to get into the right, you know, elementary school just so they can work at Goldman Sachs. And you guys yeah. are, you know, smoking pot on the weekends, going to see you Boulder and think you're going to be the next, you know, Jordan Belfort. It's not going to happen. And that was a gut shot. And I did not go into investment banking. <laughs> <laughs> but the, and the thing I think I get, I get it. I mean, I don't have any concept of, what kind of salary those have have and stuff, but I, I don't know. It, it's, I'm all about do what you're passionate about or do what you enjoy, you know, do what you're good at, do what you're good at. Um, and if you do what you're good at, things will take care of themselves because um, the whole, 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 whole debate goes on, you know, do you, do you follow your passion or do you follow your, your, your skills? Mm -hmm. um, but if you're good at something, then you're going to enjoy doing that thing. Uh, and as long right. as you enjoy doing it, it's probably a little bit of both. Okay, so we talked a couple of things, a couple of stories. I still tell parents when I meet with parents and I talk about experiences I had that you, you are probably the archetype for a couple of stories I tell. And one of them involves your first semester of college oh, and yeah. uh, those experiences. So um, kind of, and, and just so you know, I mean, that, that experience of that first semester 
happens again and again and again for parents. I, I talk to parents all the time. I'll follow up with a lot of parents um, in about this time of year. And I'll say, hey, say, how the first semester go? So how did your first semester of college go? From a academic perspective, I fell flat on my face. Um, my first semester of college, I ended up getting a, it was, I think it was like a 2.8, like 2.7 or 2.8, um, which in high school, like I was like, you know, damn near like a 4.0 student. And you know, I set the bar pretty high in terms of expectations for my parents. Um, but I was doing a lot of things that I wasn't doing in high school. So, I mean, like I pledged a fraternity that came with its own, you know, bag of new experiences. And, you know, most of them were not like, Hey, let's go study. Like it was, you know, it was a lot of like, essentially just to be frank, it was a lot of partying. It's a lot of getting to know new people. It's college that first semester was getting my bearings socially. And it is like a, an extremely overwhelming time. Um, it's a lot of things that are a lot more fun than, than advanced college rhetoric or college algebra, right? Yeah, no. And, and to, you know, to be honest with high school, once, by the time you get to your senior year, you've probably been in the same classes with these people for four years, maybe more if you've been in the, you know, went to middle school together, whatever college you get there and you don't know anybody and everybody's from a different state and everybody just wants to have fun. And so you're just meeting new people, having fun, like really getting your bearings socially. Um, and so academics fell by the wayside, definitely. So I went home to my parents about 20 pounds heavier, a whole lot dumber. And, you know, they had just shelled out an absurd amount of money for me to go do these things. And I was like, Hey guys, like I got a, a, a 2.8, but I still feel like I learned a lot. Tough sell. What was, Top self what sure. was Newha's response to that? <laughs> it was, it was like, that's great. I'm glad you're learning, but like, what did you learn? You got a, a 2.8, like clearly you didn't learn much. Like the way they put it, it was like, I was really close. If I had a 2.0, I'd only learned half the material. Arguably. So they were saying I learned a little bit above half of what I needed to know. Um, but you know, that that's college for, for most people in their first semester is, you know, just it, it's really a, a, a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> what was so? What, what was the big thing you, you've always talked about? Like you talked to our kids that we work with that summer about like this was the big thing I did different my second semester and it worked out pretty well. Yeah, and it's it's really funny, but it's just go to class. Um, I think part of that first semester of college is this newfound freedom where you don't have to go to class. Um, you know, some t some professors had an attendance policy, and we'd have these clickers where you click in. Well, people figured out you could just give your clicker to somebody else. And as far as the professor knows, you're there. So if you don't want to go to class in college, you don't have to. Um, but there is a direct correlation between how often you go to class and how well you do in that class. Um, and there are very few exceptions to that. So one of the things you got to do is show up. That's it. Show up. Don't party on a Tuesday and miss class on Wednesday. Just go. Um, wait for the weekend. And then once you're in class, sit in the front of the class. That's like a huge thing because your first year, you mean first couple years of college are going to be a lot of 300, 350 person lectures, sometimes even more. But the classroom is only as big as the people that you can see in front of you. So if you're in the front row and it's just you and, and the professor and the people to your right and your left, that's not a 350 person lecture anymore. You know, and so um, go to class, sit up front, pay attention, and you'll you'll get a C plus minimum if you just do those things and nothing else. Take notes by hand, take notes on laptop. Any difference in those two things? I, I mean, I know there's studies that say, um, you know, it's, it's better to take notes by hand than laptop because it, you know, it, it sticks with you more. Um, I don't necessarily know the mechanics behind that, but um, so in an ideal world, if you're going to take notes, take notes by hand. But that being said, it is better to take notes than not take notes at all. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, um, what did you do? So there was actually my strategy was to not take notes at all during class, um, because what I found was I would start writing things down. I, when I would take notes, I'd write them down by hand. But I would hear something the professor said, start writing it down. And then I'd miss the whole you know, next thing a professor said. 
So my strategy was sit down and listen in class. And then most professors will post their lecture slides um, online okay. after class. And I would go back after class and take notes on them. Okay. Um, but that way I was actually interacting with the information and asking myself questions as opposed to missing bits and pieces and just having, oh, that's cool. you know, like a, basically a, a jigsaw puzzle in my notebook that had missing pieces. So, so you, you started this off, you're talking about, you know, being a, a COVID graduate, right? So you, you had a, I mean, well, I guess I, I'm really curious. I, I guess I need to talk to someone who's like a junior now or so, because that since the last semester, fall of 2020, or sorry, spring of 2020, that was your last semester in college, right? You graduated 2020? Yeah, that was the last one. And that was so, when everything went to shit, basically. So, yeah. but, but you didn't have any class. I'm, I'm really curious how, um, yeah, one of the things I saw was, so my professor who, who doesn't understand YouTube's autoplay is now going to, is or auto, what is it, auto continue or whatever is now yeah, going yeah. to teach me online. I'm really <laughs> curious how the online classes are going. I know, I know the stories I'm hearing are not good, that cheating is through the roof. Um, that, uh, you know, that even in the high schools, like the, the South Lake high school, I think they've gone to everything. I, I talked with the teacher this week They're, they've dropped uh, final exams. They're not going to do final exams just because, uh, the students that I am meeting with now, they tell me there's like four or five students in a class. That's it. And I'm meeting with students in person who are doing the DVA, mm-hmm. but you know, there's, there's four or five students. And one of my students has, has one class where he's the only student there. And like yesterday, both the teachers, it's, there, there were two teachers for that class and he's, he's the only student and everyone else is logged in online, but they're right. logged in online. Their cameras are off. Uh, one of my friends posted a picture one day of his class where his, his camera was the only one that was on and his mic was the only one that was on. Everybody else's camera was off and muted. And we've just, we've, for so many students on the high school level, so I'm curious how it's have just lost a semester entirely, probably an entire year. I'm really curious how it's happened for college. So for us, for, for my graduating class in particular, um, I don't want to say there's anything good that came out of COVID because that's like a very, I don't know, that's insensitive in my opinion. But when you're in the final semester of college and all you want to do is finish, doesn't matter how well you finish, everything's switching to online all of a sudden all our classes went to pass fail format instead of letter grade format. It almost in a lot of ways took a lot of pressure off of us because things did become easier. Now you ask the question of why did things become easier? It was because no professor was prepared to have to migrate their entire curriculum online. And so a lot of times they're pulling questions from the internet from public test banks, basically, like where you could Google the question and it's going to come up. So, and it wouldn't even be, even be considered cheating. This is on homework. Like, you know, things where you're probably going to want to verify your answers anyway. You know, and homework in college, in a lot of cases, will make up about a third of your grade. So things became much easier. And for the younger students now who, you know, they still have a, a lot to learn. You know, they're still trying to lay the foundation for their degree. Um, I definitely think they're getting... They're, they're robbing themselves in a lot of ways because cheating is a huge problem in college, especially in this online format. And there are ways to circumvent everything. I've had, I've seen people plug in an HDMI to a TV, they connect their computer to a TV, have the TV up and then have their friends in the room looking at the test answer question or the test questions with them, um, you know, while they're taking like an exam. And it really just kind of corrupts the, the, it corrupts the learning experience. I would argue the that classes, not learning at all. Any of the exams you took, did you do that? Because so there are these online uh, proctor services now, Proctorio and ProctorU. Yeah. Did you use, do you have to use any of those? Yes. Yeah, so in our semester, they like didn't even have the software ready for it. So we didn't have Proctorio. I know that with these, um, you know, the, the younger students now, um, they use those online, um, you know, AI proctoring services, whatever. Um, but even then, like people who want to cheat, find a way. Like, and, and that's the, that's just the reality. Um, and so it is definitely 
a huge problem. And I think it's really disappointing because it shifts the priorities of students from like, let me learn the material. Let me like, I'd rather somebody knows 80% of the information and gets a B as opposed to getting an A, but they cheated and they only know 60% of it. You heard me say, I mean, I said this all the time when you were in don't play school. There's so many kids and they do it. It's, it's, it's playing school, get the grade. And for parents, because the students are making A's, they don't think there's any problem before. Right. I, I heard, you know, because so many schools have gone to test optional, right? That there's a way to apply. And colleges, honestly, right now, colleges are panicking. Um, colleges are very worried about uh, being able to fill their next class. Um, Pre-COVID, we had situations where, you know, it was something like 50% of universities in the summer before the next semester had not yet filled their freshman class. They were trying, still trying to fill their freshman class. And now that COVID's happened and the, the economy's down and all, all this stuff, and then state, state uh, budgets are going to go, so many things are going to go on that yeah. are going to hurt the pocketbook. Colleges are very worried. And so really several things are happening. They're admitting, they're going to, they're going to admit more students because they know that fewer, a smaller percentage of the students they admit will actually enroll. They're going to, um, so they're going to accept fewer students, I should say. They're going to um, have longer waiting lists. They're going to defer more students early. All of that's going to go on because colleges are panicking a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm ready now for the whole story. So one of the students, I, I, I read a story, uh, someone was very proud of the student who had a 4.0, uh, had the 4.0 and a 1200 SAT and just couldn't get their SAT high enough, but they got into a &M engineering anyway. Mm. And I get it. An SAT does not indicate, an ACT score does not indicate whether or not that student's going to be successful in college. But it definitely indicates how well that student has mastered math, math knowledge. And if you're right. not breaking a, uh, you know, if you're not breaking a 650 in math, I really worry about what you set that student up, sending them off to a mechanical engineering or an engineering degree. They didn't say which kind of engineering, but setting them off to an engineering degree. If they don't, again, back to the thing, there's some lessons that life is going to have to teach you. And yeah. uh, it's great that your mom says you're awesome because uh, everybody's mom says you're awesome. But then when you actually realize that, wow, that calculus class is pretty tough and my professor doesn't speak English all that well, and I'm having to write. I mean, what was your, what, what's the hardest math you took? Uh, for me, it was actually uh, financial derivatives because wow. it did involve, it wasn't so, it, it was a lot of like theoretical calculus in a lot of ways. Um, and that like, uh, you know, in high school, I took statistics. I didn't even take like, I, I didn't even take a calculus class. I took pre-calculus. So I didn't have a, a very, mathy brain um but that was like financial derivatives like is a lot of like you know theories and formulas and like you know there's symbols i saw it's like i didn't even know that was a thing uh, you know um and you you adapt or die <laughs> so i figured it out and i ended up doing all in the class but um you know that 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 was like tough that was definitely tough you know well and, and I, that student's probably gonna even if the student's a hard-working student she's probably gonna be fine um, if she's willing to do the work, I just, it, again, I, I worry about some of that, that I did. Cause that, that is what that, a series seven exam, it's going to tell us, it's going to tell them how well you understand the laws that in, the, the regulations involved in trading, right? That's the whole idea. An, an SAT and ACT, what they measure is how well you manage the material that you've been taught. Not necessarily right. because I tell students now in, in today's high schools, when you walk into an on-level class, you basically have a 93 in that on-level class. And yeah. you're either going to do extra work that's going to push you into a 99 or you're going to do, or you're going to miss some assignments and you're going to end up with an 83. Um, and then a G, an AP class, drop it 10 points, but the same rules apply, right? You basically start with it with a low B and then you make it better or you make it worse. If you just do all the work that's required, same kind of deal. And, and I think we, and people say, well, they're just not going to put up with that in college. And, and the other side, we talked about this before we started, right? When you get to college, you realize, no, they do put up with that in college. Like that's not yeah. what their focus is on. They don't, they don't care. Professors don't care in college. They're not going to hold your hand. If you got a 25 in the class, they might not even email you. Like it's on you to decide like, all right, like, is this working out? You know, so like, the counselor's not going to sit down with the parents and they're not going to look and make sure you're feeling okay about things and make sure everything's happy for you. That's not going to no. happen. 
No, no you're, res- you're responsible for yourself, unfortunately. It's, and you, you are 18. I mean, I, I get it. You're 18 at that time. You're a legal adult, that kind of thing. So, yeah. so I get the reason. But yeah, I think we, we, we create a misperception. I've actually heard stories of parents that have called professors and said, hey, I'd like to have a meeting. And the professor's yeah, like, no. that's nice that <laughs> you like yeah. that, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Was the major you started with, I, I know the answer to this, but let's, let's hear the story. Was the major you started with the major you graduated with? No. Um, so I, I was always a huge fan of Shark Tank. And I thought that I want to be one of those guys pitching to these sharks. Um, and I want to be an entrepreneur. So I wanted to study entrepreneurship. Um, but I kind of quickly realized that, and you know, take this with a grain of salt. There are still some very valuable things you learn in an entrepreneurship, um, you know, based degree. But I think entrepreneurship is more about a certain spirit. It's about um, being willing to hustle. Um, it's about coming up with an idea. And how do I introduce that idea to people? I felt like those, you know, I had a, a good foundation already, um, you know, with those skills. I'm very sociable. I'm good at articulating concepts to people. Didn't you start um, a business when you were still in high school? Yeah, we did. I mean, it was me and, and Christian Barham, but um, we started a car wash business where it was just a door-to-door service. We'd just knock on people's doors and say, hey, like, you know, we know you hate going to the car wash, so we can do it here. And people, like, we, <laughs> it actually worked really well. Um, and that is the spirit of entrepreneurship. It's just go out and try it. And so I realized that I needed more technical skills. As I mentioned earlier, um, I was not a very, I wasn't very good at math. And so I wanted to do something that was numbers intensive because I wanted to turn a weakness into a strength. So I ended up double majoring in accounting and finance. And now, now I have a, now I have a a very good grasp on numbers. Um, But I still maintain the same entrepreneurial, you know, spirit that I had before. And so now I feel like, you know, on a personal level, in terms of my aptitude for certain business skills and knowledge, I'm much more well-rounded than if I had just gone with entrepreneurship. So my advice would be think of the bigger picture. Don't always just go to study something you're already good at. Consider studying something that you actually don't know and want to learn. That's why you're in college, you know, that you're, you're there to learn something you otherwise don't know. So you know, just something to consider. I know that's not good advice for everyone, but you, know, you said your first your first job was one where you were you were doing what corporate recruiting. Yeah, yeah, so that, that was a learning experience that in, in and of itself. Basically, um, companies need help finding the right talent to hire, um, and this happens from positions all the way down to you know, like a staff accountant, which is basically like an entry level accountant in a company all the way up to the CEO. They oftentimes need help identifying the best possible candidates. So they'll outsource that help to a recruiting firm. That's where I was working. Okay. Being and you a part of a recruiting of firm sucks. Yeah, uh, that- say that again, say that again. What, what, no, what did you just say? Uh, I was saying it sucks. Like it, that, that job sucked, like it wasn't for me. And I mean, the people I worked with were awesome. Like great people, great office environment, but the work itself, I absolutely dreaded. That's actually what I was asking about. Like what, yeah. so what were the things you said you had to do a cold calling, right? And so that's yeah. lots, lots hearing no a lot. Yeah. A I mean, call. it's, it's basically like, we've all gotten those calls where it's somebody on the line and, you know, sometimes it's an automated thing. Sometimes it's somebody going, hi, like, you know, we're with blah, blah, blah. And you hang up before they even finish the first sentence, you know, um, that's what my job was on a very regular basis is calling people, trying to solicit our, um, recruiting services. And it was just, you know, a thousand no's occasionally one yes, but it wasn't very rewarding work. So I quickly fell out of that. So you were, you were calling to get people, you were calling to find people to recruit or finding people who would use your recruiting service. I was calling, I was contacting businesses, um, and saying, Hey, like we're a recruiting firm based out of Denver. We specialize in placing finance, finance and accounting candidates, um, you know, if you're interested in those services, like, give me a call, like, you know, we have candidates that we can place at your company. Okay. So I was basically doing sales development for, for a, a recruiting firm. 
And I was, I, I get, I get not those calls, but I get calls like that all the time. I always try to be at least kind uh, and polite because I got to figure you're, you're just hearing hangups. Like what's the yeah. worst, what's the worst response you ever got? The worst. So I actually was like, I got, most people were pleasant. It was, you know, like that, that I was speaking to or that were willing to speak with me. Um, but the funniest story I heard was uh, my boss called somebody and they said they would never, ever utilize recruiting services ever. Um, but then like five years later, they ended up using him and he made like $200,000 off that same person. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you confront on occasion nasty people that are just like, you know, this is stupid. Why are you even bothering me? Or even just how the hell did you get my number? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's another thing, you know, um, it's so it was not very rewarding work in the, you know, like the successive path, um, the upward mobility was very un unclear to me um, in that space. And I wanted to feel like I was making progress. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't abundantly clear to me in that industry, unfortunately. So one of the things I think is going to be fascinating the questions I want to ask on this in the podcast to people is what are things you were told were super important in high school that you got to college and you're like, yeah, that didn't turn out to be very important. Oh man. Um, things I was told in high school. I mean, look, uh, one of them, I think we always said is like, we, we had touched on it earlier, but it's just professors are not going to put up with that. And I want to, I want to touch on that a little bit more. I, I think it's important to, to, to really accentuate because the reality is in, in high school, you know, your teacher probably like how many students were you teaching at one time, like for one section of a class, one section of a class, it, it would usually by the end of it, it was 25, but it could be 34. I typically carried about 150 to 165 students. Yeah. Total. So you say like you got a, 165 students total. There are professors that are teaching multiple sections of 350 students. Oh, wow. You know, like, like, you know, they have a lot on their plate and they're, you know, they got TAs that are doing the grading. Like it's more of like an automated process than it is like, Hey, let's, let me sit down and get to know you. Professors do not care in, in college. They're there to teach the material. It's on you to absorb it. End of story. That's it. Now, if you want to go in and see them for office hours, that's you, you go do that. That's a good thing. I recommend that. Yeah, you should but, do that, right? You should try yeah, to you to definitely on. should do that. But professors are not available to you in the same capacity that teachers were in high school, you know? And so I guess if there's just one thing I'd wish I'd, I'd known that wasn't made clear to me in high school is that professors aren't the resource that you think they're going to be. And that a lot of it falls on your shoulders. Like, you know, you are responsible for you. If you don't go to class, nobody's going to email you. If you don't, if you do bad on a test, nobody's going to say, Hey, come in. Like we should talk about this. Like you are just a number, a, a grade and, and, you know, a, literally a student ID number on a sheet. That's it. That's, that's um, really your, your, your freshman and sophomore classes at a lot of public yeah, universities. That changes as time goes on. So that way we're not fear mongering about. Yeah. I mean, but that changes as you get more specialized in your classes. But in the beginning, it's a tough transition from mm -hmm. high school to college when you're like, how, like I raised my hand, how come, you know, he didn't call on me, you know, it's like, because you're, you know, on the left side, probably 40 feet, you know, out of his peripheral vision. And that's like just the way it is sometimes, you know, his or her. Yeah. Vision. What's, um, so, okay. I, I was going to, I was thinking, yeah, I, I do know that, I mean, there are some, some schools. One of the things I've heard from some students, did you do an honors college or anything like that? No, I didn't. I was, I've heard that, that one thing I have heard, like one student who was very frustrated because she felt like she had played the game all the way through high school because, and she was willing to play the game in high school so that she wouldn't have to play the game in college. And then she got to college and she was at a big flagship state university. And here she was through these classes that it was classes of 300. But the one thing that saved her was being in some honors classes at that university. That way, at least her honors classes were small enough right. that um, she was able in those classes to engage. Otherwise, you know, if you're taking, if your freshman year is uh, 
your history, your biology, your whatever else. None of the other classes you take that freshman year. So there's like lit- literature. There's like a you know lower division yeah. literature that you got to take usually if you didn't get that in high school. I mean, those are all classes that are just packed with yeah 150. Students, everybody needs students. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it is the TA that you're going to be working with. And, and the, the TA is the person who's grading your papers. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I like to tell students that, you know, when you're, I, you did this in the, in the app camp, was talk at the, in the, in the app camp and say, look, the, the TA is going to have like, a, a, what they call it, um, a non-credit discussion class. And a lot of students are like, well, I'm not getting credit for it. I'm not going to show up. But the, that class, the week before you have an exam, definitely show up for that class because the TA yeah. is going to be like, well, the professor said to really study this for the test. And that's like right. a big warning. So uh, show up for those things. Um, so what are things that I guess we would touch on that the, the didn't seem important in high school that now you're like, well, that really was a big deal like that. Yeah. That, uh, that I should have I like in high school. You're like that. Don't do that. But then we kind of touched on that. Um, uh, any other, I mean, I, I, I'm at the end of the list of the things. Oh, it's the cold calling, you, you getting the nose a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so I think the uh, other, one of the, one of the really important things to touch on with college too is, is, you know, like I said, in high school, you, you think you have this concrete planned plan figured out and that college is this next step, you know, to having everything figured out all of a sudden. I am just as clueless now about my life as I was four years ago at my freshman year of college. And I was just as clueless at the beginning of college as I was, you know, like in high school, like the, the, the mystery of life doesn't go away. The more you progress in your education, you're constantly just uncovering more about yourself. And, you know, it's a bunch of choices. It's all it is. You're not going to have, you're not going to have anything figured out. Don't think that, you know, and and this is like for students in high school that maybe will listen to this, but don't, don't go to college thinking that, you know, this is a concrete step in a much broader concrete plan. There is so much that's going to change and you have to roll with the punches that you just have to. And like, you're not going to be the same person you were when you devised these plans, you know? Um, So there is so much to learn outside of the classes you take and, you know, the cert- the certifications I'm getting, you know, there's so much more to life than that. It's one very small piece. So yeah, that, that is such a great place to stop. Sadly, though, I did think of one more question I wanted to ask. Sure, sure. But, and, and this is one that I don't want you to, that's a great comment to make though, about like, just, it's okay if things change because what we know, I need to go look up the data on this to get the exact numbers, but the percentage of students who change majors and drastically, like at least you change majors from something inside the business school to something else inside the business school. If you decide to go from an engineering to communications major, that's going to be a much bigger change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, or, or, or change schools because not colleges in a lot of cases aren't committed to honoring the, the credits that you had. So right. being able to understand that and, and understanding that it's not a, it's not a, that happens. It's just something that, that is a part of the process is critical. I, I was curious because we're hearing a lot about, you know, uh, president elect Biden has promised to forgive so much student debt, student debts. I mean, I talk about student debt all the time. I'm a big advocate of trying to make certain you don't have debt. Did you end up with any kind of debt or do you have any loans that you, that you specifically, I'm not writing numbers necessarily, but you specifically are, are ending up with, or are you fortunate? So fortunately, you know, I'm an only child and my parents do really well. So I didn't have any debt. Um, But I know that like, if there is going to be, you know, like if you're going to be paying for your own school or, you know, you you know, your parents just can't get afford it or you don't get scholarship money, like that should be a critical factor in your decision. Because in a lot of ways, a degree that costs you $200,000 is the same as one that maybe costs you $10,000 in total. You get the same piece of paper. And I've done three job interviews so far. Some of them didn't even ask to see my degree. They just asked like what I studied or, you know, they didn't ask what grades I got. Like they don't care. So the finances of college are something to consider. The big thing I've been telling high school students now is on, and on the, the sophomores I was talking to the last couple of days is on in June of 2023, no one is going to care what you made on the SAT ever again. 
Like that's right. not, not going to happen. Uh, is an MBA on your horizon? You going to try for an MBA? Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, one of my ultimate goals is to hopefully start my own business one day. So it's more of like whatever happens first, if I'm still with fidelity or a company and I want to, you know, jump another rung um, in, in my career, uh, an MBA is definitely something that I would do. Um, and a lot of times companies will pay for you to go get your MBA, which is really cool. Um, but, you know, hopefully if I manage to start my own company, I'm not going to tell myself that I need to go get my MBA. <laughs> ideally, ideally, I want to be done with school. Um, I really, I was really done by the end of college, like just fatigued and, and unhappy. So, um, but we'll see, you okay. know, as always, things are always subject to change. Just got to, just got to roll with it. Man, thank you so much for the first interview. I hope it, 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 learning a lot about how to do it and that kind of stuff. It's fantastic, man. Great stuff. So appreciate it. Um, I'm going to follow up with you and see in six months how the series seven is going and the series 63 is going. So um, thanks, dude. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if you ever need anything, you know how to find me. Looking forward to it. Thanks, man. Take care.